A couple of years ago, I went to Tokyo with my husband and I ate at the most remarkable sushi restaurant. I don't even eat fish, I'm vegan, so that tells you how good it was. Even with just vegetables, this sushi was the stuff you dream about. The restaurant had six seats. My husband and I marveled at how anyone could make rice so superior to all other rice. We wondered why they didn't make a bigger restaurant and be the most popular place in town. Our local friends explained to us that all the best restaurants in Tokyo are that small and do only one type of dish, sushi or tempura or teriyaki, because they want to do that thing well and beautifully. And it's not about quantity, it's about taking pleasure in the perfection and beauty of the particular. I'm still learning now that it's about good and maybe never done, that the joy and work ethic and virtuosity we bring to the particular can impart a singular type of enjoyment to those we give to and of course to ourselves. In my professional life, it also took me time to find my own reasons for doing my work. The first film I was in came out in 1994, again, appallingly, the year most of you were born. I was 13 years old upon the film's release, and I can still quote what the New York Times said about me verbatim. Ms. Portman poses better than she acts. The film had a universally tepid critical response and went on to bomb commercially. That film was called The Professional, or Leon, in Europe. And today, 20 years and 35 films later, it is still the film people approach me about the most to tell me how much they loved it, how much it moved them, how it's their favorite movie. I feel lucky that my first experience releasing a film was initially such a disaster by all standard measures. I learned early that my meaning had to be from the experience of making the film and the possibility of connecting with individuals rather than the foremost trophies of my industry, financial and critical success. And also that those initial reactions could be false predictors of your work's ultimate legacy. I started choosing only jobs I was passionate about and from which I knew I could glean meaningful experiences. This thoroughly confused everyone around me, agents, producers, and audiences alike. I made Goya's Ghosts, a foreign independent film, and studied art history, visiting the Prado every day for four months as I read about Goya and the Spanish Inquisition. I made V for Vendetta, a studio action movie for which I learned everything I could about freedom fighters who in other eyes might be called terrorists from Menachem Begin to the Weather Underground. I made Your Highness, a pothead comedy with Danny McBride and laughed for three months straight. I was able to own my meaning and not have it be determined by box office receipts or prestige. By the time I got to making Black Swan, the experience was entirely my own. I felt immune to the worst things anyone could say or write about me and to whether an audience felt like going to see my movie or not. It was instructive for me to see that ballet dancers, for ballet dancers, once your technique gets to a certain level, the only thing that separates you from others is your quirks or even flaws. One ballerina was famous for how she turned slightly off balance. You can never be the best technically. Someone will always have a higher jump or a more beautiful line. The only thing you can be the best at is developing your own self. Authoring your own experience was very much what Black Swan itself was about. I worked with Darren Aronofsky, the film's director, to change my last line in the movie to, it was perfect, because my character Nina is only artistically successful when she finds perfection and pleasure for herself, not when she's trying to be perfect in the eyes of others. So when Black Swan was successful financially and I began receiving accolades, I felt honored and grateful to have connected with people, but the true core of my meaning I had already established and I needed it to be independent of people's reactions to me. People told me that Black Swan was an artistic risk, a scary challenge to try to portray a professional ballet dancer, but it didn't feel like courage or daring that drew me to it. I was so oblivious to my own limits that I did things I was woefully unprepared to do. And so the very inexperience that in college had made me feel insecure and made me want to play by others' rules now was making me actually take risks I didn't even realize were risks. When Darren asked me if I could do ballet, I told him that I was basically a ballerina, which by the way, I wholeheartedly believed. When it quickly became clear in preparing for the film that I was maybe 15 years away from being a ballerina, it made me work a million times harder. And of course, the magic of cinema and body doubles helped the final effect. But the point is, if I had known my own limitations, I never would have taken the risk. And the risk led to one of my greatest artistic and personal experiences in that I not only felt completely free, I also met my husband during filming. 
Similarly, I just directed my first film, A Tale of Love and Darkness, and was quite blind to the challenges ahead of me. The film is a period film, completely in Hebrew, in which I also act, with an eight-year-old child as a co-star. All of these are challenges I should have been terrified of, as I was completely unprepared for them. But my complete ignorance as to my own limitations looked like confidence and got me into the director's chair. Once there, I had to figure it all out, and my belief that I could handle these things, contrary to all evidence of my ability to do so, was half the battle. The other half was very hard work. The experience was the deepest and most meaningful one of my career. Now clearly, I'm not urging you to go perform heart surgery without the knowledge to do so. <laughs> Making movies admittedly has less drastic consequences than most professions and allows for a lot of effects that make up for mistakes. The thing I'm saying is, make use of the fact that you don't doubt yourself too much right now. As we get older, we get more realistic and that gets and that, it, and that includes about our own abilities or lack thereof. And that realism does us no favors. People always talk about diving into things you're afraid of. That never worked for me. If I'm afraid, I run away, and I would probably urge my child to do the same. Fear protects us in many ways. What has served me is diving into my own obliviousness, being more confident than I should be, which everyone tends to decry in American kids and those of us who have been grade inflated and ego inflated. Well, it can be a good thing if it makes you try things you never might have tried. Your inexperience is an asset and will allow you to think in original, unconventional ways. Accept your lack of knowledge and use it as your asset. I know a famous violinist who told me that he can't compose because he knows too many pieces, so when he starts thinking of a note, an existing piece immediately comes to mind. Just starting out, one of your biggest strengths is not knowing how things are supposed to be. You can compose freely because your mind isn't cluttered with too many pieces, and you don't take for granted the way things are. The only way you know how to do things is your own way. You here will all go on to achieve great things. There is no doubt about that. Each time you set out to do something new, your inexperience can either lead you down a path where you will conform to someone else's values or you can forge your own path, even if you don't realize that's what you're doing. If your reasons are your own, your path, even if it's a strange and clumsy path, will be wholly yours and you will control the rewards of what you do by making your internal life fulfilling.